Welcome to The Bill Walton Show, featuring conversations with leaders, entrepreneurs, artists and thinkers. Fresh perspectives on money, culture, politics and human flourishing. Interesting people, interesting things. If you're like me, you're wondering what we can do to, to find anything good in what's going on in the world with the red-blue political divide. Politics has become unbelievably pox- toxic. The country seems to be ripped apart. I used to call this show common, On Common Ground, and then I spent a little time with that idea, and then I couldn't find any common ground, so I just went back and named it, <laughs> named it The Bill Walton Show. It was easier. Um, and then uh, along comes Jim Pinkerton with a book soon to be published, uh, t- uh, The Secret of Directional Investing, uh, Making Money Admits the Red-Blue Divide. Uh, Jim worked for uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, uh, George Bush the Elder and had a long, illustrious career, including time, long stint as a Fox News contributor and uh, smart guy. I've known him for a while and always outside the box thinking, big picture thinking. He uh, you know, he's got a lot of a lot of really interesting ideas, but I I want to I want to get practical to, practical today to see how we can make some money out of the out of the evident political catastrophe we're in the midst of. Jim, great to see you. Okay, thanks, Bill. Thanks for having me. So, making money amidst the red blue rumble. Well, let's take an example. Uh, if if you'd known that Disney was going to go woke and crash its markets and wreck the Star Wars franchise, you would have shorted Disney, and then you would have enjoyed watching Disney go down 40%, making money. You know, in other words, just a, a, a the, you know, the secret of directional investing is about, I, you know, the, the basic investment wisdom, the trend is your friend. So if you identify the trend, you know, it's better to be in the tech business than the buggy whip business as a trend, for example, you can make money. And one of the big trends of our time as the, title of the book suggests, is the red-blue split. So if you look at companies that have attempted to be national and yet they've gone woke, they have hurt themselves badly with the national market. We're talking Disney, we're talking, you know, AB, Bud Light, uh, you know, Planet Fitness, uh, you know, uh, and then most, probably most spectacularly of all, BlackRock. You know, BlackRock, you know, is the biggest investment company in the world. And, you know, they've gone woke, and I would say they've sort of become blue rock, and it's hurt them. And so then the question becomes, speculatively, is there room for a red rock? And, <laughs> and, when, you, and when you see people, you know, Ken Griffin leaving Chicago to go to Florida, Carl yeah. Icahn, uh, you know, uh, Evergreen Investment going to Texas, you start to realize, yes, there could be, as Governor Abbott of Texas says a Wall Street West, or as Governor DeSantis would say, a Wall Street South. And those that's full of implications, not only for those companies, but also for real estate. I mean, you know, Palm Beach is, the value of real estate in Palm Beach has tripled in the last five years. Well, uh, Palm Beach, or not Palm Beach, but Miami is well on the way to becoming the uh, the alternate financial capital of, uh, of the Western Hemisphere, really. I mean, it's long been a home to all the flight capital from Central and South America. And now it's home to flight capital from the rest of the United States. Exactly. And, <laughs> and you look at Brazil. We're, we're at? Being, in, being in Illinois is almost as bad as being in Bolivia. Uh, listen, I'm from Illinois. And, I know. And, you grew and, up and in Evanston, yeah, right? Yeah. Let's see. There's a, there's a, <laughs> you know, the, the Pritzker family has just chosen to try and make Illinois the sort of transgender surgery capital. So what, what's with that? I work, I was a, when I was a baby banker in the 70s, I was like 26 years old, and Jay Pritzker became a pr- customer of the bank, and they assigned me to him. And it was interesting to learn from him. He was a fabulous guy, very smart, very, very down to earth. And then all of a sudden, he made these billions of dollars and produced these offspring and cousins of his, you know, brothers of his that had children. And then one generation leads to the next. Priskers are catastrophe. So do you, <laughs> do you have a theory of what happened? To the- I, 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 other than, you know, some sort of, you know, multi-generational saga, you know, right okay, out of well, know, the Magnificent Ambersons or something. Uh, so when you, uh, write, when you write your novel, we'll, we'll, cover, <laughs> we'll do the prisoner novel. The, the, I mean, the decline and fall of, of, of a dynasty or something. But what's interesting <laughs> is, you know, the Illinois has chosen a certain path. Yeah. And it's been pretty bad. They've chosen to sort of legalize crime and raise taxes and, and then seem to think that their idea of economic development is transgender surgery. 
And, you know, other states have chosen other paths. So I hadn't focused. What, what, in terms of trans, transgender uh, capital of the world, what are they, do, what are they doing there? The, uh, Medicaid covers it. Okay. In, in Illinois. And the, the Prisker, you know, Jennifer, the former, I think, James Prisker, now Jennifer Prisker, is a leading figure in this transgender thing. There's a woman named Jennifer Bilek. You ought to get her on the show sometime. She's quite interesting on this topic. And... You know, they have a serious argument that there's just the future of humanity involves changing your gender and so on and so on. And, you know, it's kind of out of science fiction kind of stuff. And, you know, the future is unknowable. Who can say for sure that they're wrong? Right? Let, me, let, me, let me test your investment hypothesis. So if you believe in transgender, and I do not, uh, but let's say I just wanted to be cynical about my money. What's the financial play on, on uh, transgender? It becomes the medical hub. It becomes okay. the transgenderism what, you know, Cleveland Clinic or Hopkins are to cancer. Okay. You know, what's, what's the big economic driver in Baltimore these days? Johns Hopkins, right? And, and so it's, you know, I mean, states, that's a, a big part of what's going on. This is a big trend is, again, as red and blue divide, as they achieve a separate and distinct consciousness. You know, in, the, in the book, I point out, you know, in their respective 2020 three inaugural addresses. You know, Gavin Newsom used the word freedom 23 times. And Ron DeSantis used the word freedom 24 times. They just have completely different visions. Except of... except uh, uh, Ron DeSantis meant it. Well, okay, fair enough. But, but just, <laughs> okay, I mean, but, freedom to do different things. But Newsom, both Newsom and DeSantis won re-election let's, by Let's drill points. into that. What did Newsom mean by three, freedom? Uh, abortion. Okay, and that kind of, and that, you know, and, and just the general joy of living in a state with abortion, a, free to change your sex, free to, free to change your sex, and uh, you know, not no influence of the Christian Church or anything like that. On, okay, on things. interesting. And 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 then also they would say, and this this can't this is a trend too. You you know, Cal, Cal in 2014, California was the seventh largest economy in the world. And for 10 years now, we've been reading it's, you know, homelessness in San Francisco and crime in Los Angeles. And that's all true. However, the tech bubble, the tech wave is so strong that California has gone from seventh to fourth or fifth in the world economy. You know, NVIDIA, you know, covers for a lot of sins. And so the, uh, another trend clearly is that tech is gaining in ascendancy, gaining. And, you know, the hubs of tech are you know, California, Washington State, Massachusetts, and so on. And that's something we have to you know, keep in mind as, as conservatives. I have, I, have a, I have a chapter in the book called The United States of Arbitrage. I say, you know, look, just envision a world where you go to California, they got lots of money, and they give you a green energy subsidy, you can have an abortion, and then you go to Texas for a gun and a tax cut. It becomes a way of thinking about, you know, you know arbitrage is a venerable investment concept and, and a lifestyle concept too for that matter and i think those are the sorts of choices that americans investors and just citizens are, are going to have going forward do i want to live in in massachusetts or i don't want to live in florida and you know, there's and there's plenty of people who would say you know i would never live in florida let's do a tutorial explain federalism and let's talk about how that's working here. Fed federalism is a, a concept that be most associated with James Madison, you know, the, the principal author of the Constitution, who was at great pains to say that the states are prior to the federal government. And actually, you know, James Madison wrote the Virginia Resolution in 1799, where he said the states should be able to interpose themselves to the federal government. Mm -hmm. And then Thomas Jefferson, who was at that time the sitting vice president of the United States wrote the Kentucky Resolution, which pretty much said the same thing. You have to use the word nullification. So federalism is deeply embedded in the constitutional history of this country, which says the states are the proper delineation of political power in the United States. So I know you're a lot more than just an investment thinker. You're actually, it seems to me, you are, you are advocating a return to aggressive federalism. I, I, and where, where I the state, state, where the states, states become... rights. I call it states' rights. I okay. say I use exactly the phrase that Jefferson and Madison used, and, and for that matter, Alexander Hamilton used it as well. And yet, it's been sort of buried under history. But yeah. I put a lot of stock in the 
1932 opinion of Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis, who said the state should be the laboratories of democracy. He said, I use the quote in the, at great length, the Ice House decision of 1932 is, let our minds be bold. And if that's but, not a proper but, but not just, what is. not just an incubator of democracy, but an incubator of uh, entrepreneurship and innovation. And different states would have different specialties. Exactly. I mean, at one time or another. Like Nashville used to be just music. Now it's a lot of other things. It's, so, I mean, look at Delaware Incorporation. Yeah. And look at, and that, that the, the book begins with uh, the story of Nevada. Nevada in 1931, at, probably in Las Vegas, had a population of 5,000. And an acre of land that was what was then called the Los Angeles Highway sold for $75. Today, the metro area of Las Vegas is 2.2 million, yeah. and an acre of land on the Strip is 30 million. So they, what happened? They, they legalized gambling, and they made it work. They, they legalized gambling, and then were able to keep their franchise of legalized gambling while staying within the United States and being protected from the Russians, the Nazis, the communists, the whoever's, and, or for that matter, New Mexico. And that was sort of the political art of this is to say, it's easy to say you want to be an enterprise zone. You can be Hong Kong and be an enterprise zone. And then the Chinese come and swallow you, the Chinese communists, and you're done for. So you need, again, there's a lot of the political science here about how you can envision an enterprise zone for yourself and yet not be conquered by some military power nearby. Well, Michael Porter wrote a book 25 years ago, 30 years ago on strategy, he wrote several of, of them. And one of the books I thought was interesting was this idea of, of just what you're saying, local local communities or lo the, the, the places become hubs for a certain kind of creative talent. Hollywood became a hub for artistic filmmaking talent. Silicon Valley, tech, obviously, Wall Street, finance. Right. Nashville music, and we can extend that. But he also took it all the way back to the 14th century, where in Italy, uh, northern Italy, the, the metal workers formed a, uh, a, a, gosh, I wish I could, he had a great term for it. Maybe you... A, a cluster was the place he used. It was a, a cluster? Yeah, okay, yeah. well, anyway, so that, that, this is similar to that. Where you... it, it is. It's an observation about economic development. And, it was, yeah. and, and a lot of it is based on MIT and Stanford are just greater wealth producers. You know, Robert Solow, who was no conservative, but he won a Nobel Prize for economics, said you have to realize that capital is twice as valuable in, as labor in the economy, and innovation is twice as valuable as capital. Mm -hmm. So, again, a, a, a clear trend is, you know, if two graduate students can walk out of MIT and say, we have a way of using gamma gamma waves, which is a fancy way of saying light, to cure Alzheimer's, they can get $73 million from, from a venture capitalist to, to try it out, mostly spending it on the FDA. Did that happen? It's happening right now. It's a company called Optogenetics. Is it public? Uh, no, can we buy the public. stock? <laughs> not, but I'm sure they want to talk to you. Well, I want to have a few money-making <laughs> ideas. You can get well, it I've been somewhere. in the venture business, so but we can... It, it, <laughs> you know, and then, and then you may have recently read, it's not in the book, but about the... the AI company Suno, S-U-N-O. Yeah. A guy walks out of Harvard and says, I, I can use AI to make music. It's not just video, it's not just text, it's music. So imagine a Spotify for music. You pay him 10 bucks a month for your, your account and you the, it composes any song you want. That's the kind of value of it. Again, that's a trend to watch, which is this, you know, again, the red states, and I speak as a Republican, we have to be mindful. I mean, here we are in Maryland. You know, here we have to be mindful that tech is so strong and so powerful that you know we you know I want to I make a point in the book that if a red state were really on its on its game, thinking for itself, it would announce to the world that any student who got an eight hundred on his math his or her math SAT would get a free ride. You'd have terrific, a, terrific idea. You have a tech cluster just, 10 just, years just, later. Just Do it track in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and you'll have well, all the tech people you want five years from now. Well, you're, you're saying, you know, I've been involved in, in private equity, venture capital, all sorts of aspects of, of making money in the capital markets and, re, and building real businesses. But now I find myself here in, in Washington, the Washington area, and it seems like everything's supposed to have a government solution. And 
almost nothing as a government solution. And what you're saying is through innovation, unleashing some talent, it, it, put people uh, on a problem, uh, you, you're likely to get a solution, not not more not more layers of regulation. Exactly. And, and look, part of, I've been in this Washington since 1980, okay, and I knew Newt Gingrich really well. Well, that's a long time. It is a long time. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, but I, you went, I've you always... Went to, you went to Stanford, as I recollect. Sorry? You went to Stanford. I did, I did, yeah. I did. Yeah. And I've always sort of liked, you know, big ideas, and I always loved the idea of going to the moon and so on. And I then I noticed that lots of big projects, lots of big science projects, like the SST and the breeder reactor and the super colliding superconductor were getting killed. They were getting nimbied and killed. And uh, and I thought, well, that's a... That's NIMBY, a that, not in my backyard. NIMBY, not in my backyard, yes, right. sir. And, you know, I, 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 high-speed rail in California couldn't get anywhere. Just down the road here at Union Station, Secretary Buttigieg said, we have a wonderful plan for revising Union Station, and it'll be completed in 2040. <laughs> Union Station was built in 1907. It's a perfectly nice building. All you have to do is spiff it up a little bit. It doesn't, it shouldn't take 20 and, years. And, and, and Union Station was built, took about 18 months. Is there, it, it, yeah, yeah, the Pentagon was built in 13 months and so yeah. on. It's, it's just nuts. New, the Empire, Empire State Building in about a year, year and a half. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I began to think, though, at the same time that the government has clogged up, you know, high speed rail and Union Station and so on and so on, occasionally it punches through. For example, Governor Shapiro, Democrat of Pennsylvania, when, when, the, when the bridge fell down in, on I-95 in Philadelphia, he said, we're not going to paralyze the East Coast for the next two years while we fill out environmental impact statements. We're just going to fix it. And they did it in a month. Nobody could believe it, but he did it. So I then further thought, you know, some people are doing something. Elon Musk, in the middle of all this nimbyism and all this stuff, He's building Tesla and Starlink and SpaceX and Neuralink and so on. And that began to realize there is a trend there in certain sectors, you know, visionary, you know, uh, you know, Ayn Rand type capitalist tycoons are doing fabulous big things. And so I already think you ought to change the name of your book. Is sorry. it too late? Could you call your publisher? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can do. I can do. A, I can do. Well, the a, thing about in directional investing, investing is, I think, of something fairly passive. You know, you call up your broker, you invest in this, that, or the other thing. You're really talking about something much more dynamic. You're talking about secrets of, of building industries and, and entrepreneurship, and and uh, you know how to get rich. I mean, well, I'm, and and. Yes, I am. As, as a community, I, I, also as individuals. And to say, for example, who's your publisher? I'll give him uh, a call. Post Hill in Tennessee. All right, I'll, I'll talk. <laughs> and I, look, I, 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 you know. okay, I'm just well, but anyway, what you're talking about is, is, you know, I wasn't quite sure how to how to take this based on the title, but what you're talking about is something very fundamental that we ought to make as a matter of public policy everywhere. Well, I, actually, the last chapter is on the politics of this. And yeah. how to change the politics. And I begin with the amazing success of Grover Norquist and the yeah, tax Americans Foundation. for Tax Reform. Yeah, tax tax reform yeah. He's boiled down the no-tax message so the politicians can understand it to, 50, to, to 55 words. Okay, And he's changed the world. I mean, every, every, everybody would agree that the tax pledge has just changed the dynamic. The tax pledge is 55 words. There's yeah. actually various versions of it, but the federal okay. tax pledge is 55 words. Yeah, he's been on the show. And it's just so crisp and clean. And, look, and I worked for George H.W. Bush, who broke the pledge and was defeated for re-election in 1992. So that was a good lesson. And I, and since then, Grover has a, you know, tells that no Republican in federal office has voted for a tax increase since. Lots of governors have, but no federal office has. And, and it's a pretty amount. So, therefore... The notion of a pledge. So let's talk about that. Let's work on it. What kind of, how would we write that pledge? I, I, the challenge would be, I'll, I'll give a, a great example. Elon Musk, who was, you know, the greatest tycoon of our era. Yeah, he's, he's amazing. Uh, and, and has made going to the moon and the Mars plausible now in a way that it didn't seem, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, has been in a low-grade conflict with, of all things, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Because they would love nothing better than to say that his rocket launches are bothering the frogs and the snails and the, the whatevers. <laughs> and uh, this is, he's tweeted well, about this a lot. I'm sure it wakes him up, at least. 
Sorry? I'm sure it wakes them up at least. <laughs> it, it, he's tweeted about it. He said, sure. I, I'm trying to be an interplanetary species for human, humanity. Yeah. And these bureaucrats are shuffling papers and trying to slow me down. Right. So it would be a pledge would be if you want to get anywhere in Texas politics where SpaceX is headquartered, you have to sign a pledge that you would say that the Fish and Wildlife Service is not allowed to interfere with Elon Musk's rocket launchers. So your choice. You want to, it's, it's, Grover Norquist is the nicest, mildest personality ever. And he he also simply says, up, yeah. if you sign this pledge, I'm for you. And if you don't sign it, all these people will be against you. You, you decide, mm -hmm. Mr. Ms. Politician. I would make the same pledge on protecting, creating a protective framework around Elon Musk and rockets, starting with the Fish and Wildlife Service and extending to you know whatever else it is. And I say, this is our vision of how Texas will be the space launch capital of the world. And we know that Florida might want to compete with that. And so well, that's fine. We'll, we'll take the competition, but we will try and be as friendly to space launching in Texas as Nevada is friendly to casinos. So for a person who's thinking about what the heck to do next, you've got two notions. You've got no, you, the trend is your friend you mentioned. There's you, you can spot a trend and then you can shape a trend. Right. But as an individual, you can decide which state you want to be in based on what you believe and what you think you can do. And I guess if you want to do trends, you go to Illinois. Right. But if you don't, right. you go someplace else. So this has got... Yeah, this this is you know this is both job and 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 physical mobility. People have got to be willing to pick up and go where the opportunities are. Right. One of the books that I quote extensively is a book written back in two thousand eight by a fellow named Bill Bishop. It's called The Big Sort, and he's the making big, the, point, the big what sort S O R T. Sort? Okay, big sort. He's making the point that Americans are moving increasingly based on ideology, you know, it's, and they just simply don't feel comfortable in state X or Y. And it goes both ways. It's, you know, if you're gay, you want to get out of Alabama. And if you're, you know, anti, you know, you're, you know, pro-family, you want to be in Alabama, that kind of thing. And it's just, his, his, it's a very interesting, well done book. And so, yes, but then once you're in a state, you could then say, what if we use digital technologies? You know, I worked at Fox News for 20 years. I tried to always get this across. You know, you want to do more than just be passive and watch. You want to do something. You want to, and, and online and digital, unfortunately, the tech companies are pretty much controlled by liberals and others in this, but there should be a tech platform. I talk about this in the book, a tech platform that says, I want to take a pledge on these issues. And if I take the pledge, I will promise to vote accordingly. And I'll do it publicly. And now, peer pressure and honor say, I have to keep my pledge, not just to vote for president, but also to vote for, in primary elections and for dog catcher and state legislature and everything else. This becomes sort of a political machine. So well, let me just play this out. So you're a liberal from California and you want to move to Tennessee because there are no taxes. You've got to take a pledge not to bring all the California ideas to Tennessee. You, you could do that. You could, you could, you could, you, you could do that. You, I think you, each you, state you, government, or if you're going to move into the state, here's the pledge. You, you, could, you could, and if you said, you could say, again, if you take the pledge, you and you could. This is what digital allows for. Yeah, it's all this kind of grows out of consumer, you know, customer relationship management kind of stuff. Is you know, CRM, yeah, Facebook yeah. and y y y Yelp. the technology is clearly there already. Exactly. So it yeah. knows what we're doing, what we're saying right now, and if we, if I tell my iPhone, look. I will pledge to vote for the no tax increase, pro space, pro health innovation candidate. And now, if you, <laughs> the, the politician could say, if eight percent of the voters will be, vote for me on this, and seven percent will vote for me on that, you can now assemble a coalition, the, the, a coalition that would get you to fifty-one. The problem with the parties, the, as they are now, the Democrats and Republicans, is if you vote Republican, you can't say for sure. What you're going to get? Are you going to get MAGA and you know just general Matt Gates buffoonery, or are you going to get genuine? I care about taxes and regulation and stuff. You, just, you don't know. And what you want to do is clarify that. Say, listen, it's it's nice that you're a Republican. It's nice that you're a Democrat. What I really care about is 
space or transgenderism or tax cuts or tax increases, whatever it is. And I'm saying, and I will put my name, and it's not a legal contract. I mean, it's in the sense that you can't legally promise your vote to something. No, you it, couldn't. It's, you it's, could. a, it's not it, enforcible. But it's, 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 a, a, it's an honor thing. Yeah. Most people will not betray right. their friends. And so if I go public saying, I'm for this, and then the, the political operative says, or the digital relationship thing says, hey, Mr. Pinkerton, you haven't voted yet. It's The polls close at 7 p.m. and it's, you haven't Did, voted yet. Get, get, your, get your fanny in there. I think that would be the kind of political machine that would then say, listen, if you move your company from New York City to Tennessee or Wyoming or wherever, we will protect you in the following way. And there's an army of voters. You can not only, don't have to take my word for it, they're, they're publicly listed. There's a gallery of voter heroes there, people who have a win streak of voting in every election and every primary and everything like that. You can meet them. They'll tell you that they will always vote to defend you on this. And then you've got a governor and an attorney general who will say, look, we'll, we'll fight the federal government on this. So to make sure that we keep banking secrecy in Wyoming. So or, you and I, you and I both, my main house is in Virginia. We let's let's do this in Virginia. Let's uh, Yunkin uh, maybe are, great. Uh, Yunkin, you could use a big look, idea. Yunkin, Yunkin <laughs> I, I think of Yunkin all the time. Yeah, he, he he's I I think he's a good guy and everything. I, I voted for him. him. I know, him. but he he is not going to make it as MAGA. No, he's going to make it as. He's going to make get, it as an entrepreneur, as an innovator, as somebody that's created a lot of wealth, and the, and that's been lost in this discussion about MAGA exactly. discussion about the left right divide is nothing about what you and I are talking. About. I agree. And, and let's take an example: somebody who's prob probably a, probably somewhere between a liberal and a libertarian, somewhere, yeah, yeah. Sam Altman, right of op Open AI. Okay, yeah. he's. Hey, I, I wrote about this for Breitbart the other day. He said this AI thing is so good. I want seven trillion for chips not billion trillion now think about <clears throat> ai and the potential over the next hundred years can anybody say that seven trillion for chips for ai is too little no right exactly so no, he's no, no. he's thinking seven trillion okay arkansas virginia pennsylvania wherever florida you know, New Hampshire want that money, right? They want that chip business. It all shouldn't be in Arizona. It should be. It should be wherever you want it to be. But people should be going to Sam Altman and saying, "Put it here in my state, and here's the deal I'm going to offer you." And nobody would be better at that than Youngkin. So is Sam Altman looking for a place to uh, to hatch this from? Is he still uh, is, is he still in play? I, 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 as far as I know, the last That's, I read was uh, a month or two ago. He was going to the we UAE. We could do a lot of good if we could get him into Virginia. Uh, it'd be great. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and and that's, that's, that now it takes deep into Michael Porter cluster territory. Once you, you know, look, the reason the Northern Virginia tech boom kind of fizzled because it just couldn't keep up with, you know, Stanford and, you know. And, well, Northern and, Tech, uh, Northern Virginia doesn't have the, the, the intellectual engine. You don't have exactly. an MIT. You don't have a Stanford in Austin. They've got the University of Texas. You need you need that uh, that intellectual. Uh, firepower. I agree. That's, that's why I've suggested the eight hundred university. Yeah. Just say it, look, it would the eight hundred U if you really did it right. Oh my God, you're talking about a meritocracy, though. You know, I'm talking not... about it would be it would be nothing but Chinese and Hindus. <laughs> we're good with that, and we're, I'm good. We with are that. good. I, I'm good. I, I know exactly. <laughs> and, and and if you could deal with that, you say, listen, we don't care that you got an eight hundred in your in your English SAT. We don't care about that. We don't care about your gen gender studies and your genocide and anything like that. All we want is 800 math, and we'll get enough good professors and stuff and, and you know, adjuncts. I mean, especially in D.C., you have tons of adjuncts who know stuff. We'll, we'll have enough Nobel Prize winners to make it sort of sparkly. But the core of it is nothing but 800, 150 IQ grinds. Again, put that in Fairfax, Virginia, 10 years from now. Google. We, we, we could do some good. Yes, we could. You could. And, and you could also do things like, you know, it's, it's scandalous, speaking of Northern Virginia, what they what they do for business up there. You might have seen this in the Wall Street Journal the other day. This is not in the book, obviously. You know, the, the, the drones we have sent to Ukraine aren't working. No, they're not. The, the Ukrainians are using Chinese drones. The tanks aren't either, but something as simple as the drone we can't get right. That yeah. We, yeah. we need 
you know, Palmer Lucky and Joe Lonsdale. And people, Joe Lonsdale was nice enough to blurb my book, you know, coming in there and saying, look, we can do a lot better on defense, which is of all the things the government really should be focusing on, right? It's defense and making tech and not letting, you know, the Chinese... Defense the and infrastructure and a few other things. And that's about it. That's, that's about what government's and the state, good at. Yeah. The state should then be free to so, say, we will do as we... The voters here in X or Y, blue or red state choose. And then the American people can judge where they want to live. So you're, you're I can't, I, unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to get to your book. I read your long dis dis yeah. summary, but then I tried to buy it on Kindle. It's not ready yeah. yet. I can't wait to get the whole thing. Um, here's the issue. Only 16% of Americans, and I'm quoting you, have confidence in the federal government. According to Gallup. Well, I... I think that's high, actually. <laughs> but the, the, you've got you've got all this all these really wonderful ideas about local federalist solutions. Each state can pick the kind of thing they want, and it's not a liberal, conservative division. It's more kind of what culture you want to have in the state you're in, and that's innovation or that's lifestyle or or whatever. But you got the federal government now that's just completely overweening and and getting worse and. You can't build anything because of the federal regulation. The EPA is doing as much as it can to shut down innovation. So is the FDA. So is, you know, on and on and on the alphabet soup things. How do we how do we free up? And I know I'm not sure I expect a practical answer, but it seems that's that's the issue. Is that it, it is exactly everything's the issue. become it's, a federal it, it, a federal. It's exact, it, I, and I think that's where again to say, I'm going to vote Republican, expect that to change, nah. is not. No. A good play. I mean, again, you can say I am a Republican. However, I'm with it. I'm only going to vote for the candidates who pledge to curb the FDA, curb the EPA, and and again make it. It take, would take some brain power, but make the pledge on the EPA and the, and the FDA as clean as the Grover Norquist tax plan. And I've interacted a lot with these freshmen, sophomore congressmen that come into town. They don't know any of this. They're, they're not even remotely aware of the kind of problems they're going to face with the administrative state. I mean, they, th they think the action's in Congress, and it's not, really. I mean, it is sort of, and then right. it a lot emanates from there. But once it gets into the administrative state, it's gone, and they've taken over, and that's where the... Uh, the and, so and you're saying we could draft a pledge for each of these areas and say, okay, here's the 100 words we need to limit to 55. Here's a, Hundred, hundred thing, you know, on these five issues, you pledge to vote this way on these right. issues, and, and we record it as public information. And then a lot of the pledge could be, we think if the FDA and the EPA are the way they are at the federal level, fine. But a state can opt out. Make that 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 could be one. A sentence. state opts out of the EPA. Well, I happen or, or, to I happen to love that I idea. Mean, but... <laughs> experiment. It's, it's, well, but here's the here's you know the you see that you mentioned California. One of the problems you have, and if you're running a big company and you've got a national market, an international market, you're doing product development, and then California develops standards for an industry car. Let's pick cars right now right. or trucks. The way that the automobile makers think of it is that well, we don't care that Tennessee doesn't have the same same restraints as California because that's not as big a market. We've got to design everything for that big mar biggest market, California. And that changes what every other state gets. That that's the way California changed the country, and and, I think and, that and that's true. And that's true in textbook. I too. think that was a mistake by yeah. the other states to let that happen. If I were Tennessee, I'd say, listen, we will not allow electric vehicles here. Okay. So you want to sell a car here? Can't be electric. Well, we've got a de facto. Well, I guess Biden has now declared it at the federal level, but uh, we're wandering into. I want to I, I want to stick with the. Uh, with the actionable, um, what am I? What, what are the one of the ideas in this book that we haven't covered yet? Because well, I, I, I can, I can, I'm can, beginning to think I, this know, is uh, going to be uh, a fun read. The AI is the world's biggest energy hog, and you're not going to power it with windmills and solar and stuff. You're going to power it with that uniquely good energy source, carbon energy. And if you think climate change is an issue, okay, fine. The proper understanding of a circular economy is that carbon, which is you know the human body, your body, my body, are eighteen percent carbon. Everything in this room, including us, is a carbon sink. 
So if you think about where plastics come from, you think about where medicines come from, you think about where wood comes from, we could be capturing all the carbon if we want. We spent $20 trillion over the last 20 years on green energy and neglected carbon capture. We could easily make a grand compromise that says we're going to burn all the oil in this country. The, the total value of all the oil in this country is $217 trillion. Not right. billion, trillion. So that's, right. you know, that's $700,000 a person in America. And if the average American knew that, so we could have all this money, you could get a check from the government the way they get in Alaska for three grand a person, a person in Alaska, $3,000. All you have to do is agree that we're going to burn all the oil and natural gas and, for that, and clean coal, and we're going to capture all the carbon, and we're going to build, use it for landfill and carbon nanotubes and build a space elevator and maybe an island or two, and we're going to use it all up, and everybody's going to be rich, and you're going to have an AI and lots of money, and the air will be at you know 350 parts per million CO2. Everybody wins. That's that's in the book too. Well, CO2 is not toxic. CO2 is a beneficial uh, element. I I, I agree. Uh, I think we, the we have a, we're is, not winning that argument right now, but I think we will. I just joined the board of the CO2 Coalition, I, 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 and we've got some Nobel laureates, and I'm the only non PhD involved in it. Then the science is there. Carbon CO2 is at a 500 million year low. It's, it's also true when, when the CO2 level is 1,800 parts per million and the water level is 90 feet higher. And, and so it, it, it properly thought through, you want an efficient economy that says if, the CO, if carbon is an asset, use it. Yeah. Don't have it floating around in the atmosphere. Use it for something. Make, make buildings out of it. Use it for landfill. Make, use it for 3D printing. Use it, use it again, uh, uh, you know. Build a new island. That's that. You know, that's actually you know a, a pet idea of mine. If if you know, the population of the world has quadrupled in the last hundred years, and we're still on the same twenty nine percent of the Earth's surface. Well, are you familiar with graphene? You yeah. have to be. You seem to know about all this. Uh, George Gilder was here, and he talked about this problem, massive problem we've got, where there's a in the Pacific Ocean, there's a flotsam and jetsam, whatever the term is, or something the size of Texas, it's plastic debris, it's right. disgusting. Most of it's come from Asia, most of it's come from China. The rivers in China are the most polluted in the world. So, but one of the ideas is this plastic out there is, 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 is great raw material for graphene, and graphene is a, is a silicon substitute, and that actually could be a more, um, uh, a better technology than what we have right now. And so if you, with a little entrepreneurial uh, effort and capital, ideas, capital, and labor, you apply it to that, all of a sudden you don't have a Texas-sized uh, float in the Pacific. Instead, you've got graphene. And maybe you have Hawaii 2.0. There we go. That was an investment. How much is Hawaii worth? Okay, let's drill into that. What do you mean exactly? Well, I mean, it just takes, if the plastic is a solid, yeah. Make an island out of it. Literally make an island. <laughs> okay. Well, then that congressman who uh, who said that was worried about Puerto Rico tilting or something. Remember the island? Wake yeah, Island. Yeah, yeah, Johnson. Yeah, yeah. He's, he, <laughs> well, this one actually it, it, might th tilt. This look, this is a challenge. <laughs> All entrepreneurs, yeah, of, and visionaries face the challenge of you know you say I got a great idea. Let's go to Mars. Everybody laughs. And then you start doing it, and as Musk is doing, and look, we obviously a lot, the reason I wrote the book is to kind of get the Overton window moving in a little bit of a more positive direction. Yes, we could solve these problems. We don't need to just be despairing. The Overton window is a word, a term that everybody should know. I just learned it a few years ago, which is that there are these ideas which are totally outside the pale, ridiculous, we'll never do it, it'll never happen. And then there's conventional wisdom, which is where we live right now. Right. And almost all the good things, or all the, almost all the change, comes from ideas that are outside that Overton window, right. and then they move in over time. Right. Think, think, think about, and it, sometimes it happens. You barely even notice. You and I are both old enough to remember the pre-internet era, and if you'd said there's going to be a little thing that gives you a thing on a phone, and 95 percent of Americans by 2024 are going to be using it, and it's like a magic communications device and reads the news and everything else, we would have said. You know, that's Dick Tracy stuff. That's, that's science fiction stuff. And it happened. And it's, and it's, again, where it's allowed, you know, again, I talk a lot in the book about you build a framework. You want something to happen. You build a framework on the railroads. You get a lot of railroads. You build a framework around highways. You get a lot of highways. You, you pass the 
Communications Decency Act of 1996, and you get it through the Senate 92 to 5. I have an idea for your next job. If, if Trump gets elected, and I'm a Trump guy, but if he misses an awful lot. He doesn't cover any of this at all. I know. I think we should make you the consigliere. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, look, I, it, I think it, we need these ideas. We need, we need, we need somebody who's pushing innovate this sort of thing in in government. It, it's that the challenge. I've worked in the White House for six years total, and I know what it's like to say you have a big idea on something and then realize yeah, get killed. there's some congressman on the phone. And then something erupts, and then there's a scandal or something, and it's just it's just in it, Drew Lewis, who was a the transportation secretary under Reagan, mm -hmm. once once told me the only way you can get anything done in this world is you have to pick one or two issues, and just delegate everything else. If you're the secretary of transportation, there's a hundred things to worry about, and he just said I'm giving all 98 of them to Daryl Friend, who was the deputy back then, yeah. and I'll do two in his case, Patco and the infrastructure bill, and that was it. And he wasn't. He had a, just a very clean, incisive business, like uh, as he was, mm -hmm. to, uh, approach to life, and he got things done. It is it is incredibly hard to do this stuff, and but you certainly have no chance of succeeding if you haven't thought of it in the first place. Do you uh, get into artificial intelligence in the? Book? I do. I do. Let's talk about that. Where okay. do you see this going? I I think it's going to be as big as they say it's going to be. Yeah. A and uh, uh, you know, again, we. Conservatives, Republicans can't pretend that they're going to be viable in the future if all the AIs are built in San Francisco. Right. So I, we need our. I, own. I, I'm using AI to try to write things now. Sorry, sorry? I'm using a ChatGPT plus a lot of other ancillary. Which, uh, which is to say, some blue haired transsexual in San Francisco knows everything about you. I'm comfortable with that, but I would like to have them write in a way that I think, not the way they think. And well, you can't get it to will, do that. You, you it, can't it, get it, it to do that. It, I mean, it, we... <laughs> it should tell you something. I don't mind that, what they think. I like... <laughs> San Francisco, which every conservative loves to hate, yeah. is the hub of this. So the people who, you know, the, the science fiction writer Larry Niven once, I asked him once, what did he learn in 30 years of writing science fiction? And he said, each, what I learned, I was expecting to say something about space or something. He said, people, just as intelligent as you think just the opposite. And that just is that helped me write this book and thinking, yes, there really are people who would sit here and listen to us and say, I'm just I have just as high an IQ, but I disagree. How could they? <laughs> you know, let them let them tell you. And so that but I mean, actually there's a chapter in the book called Schismogenesis, which is to say in anthropology. When two tribes start fighting, they both sort of get stronger. They they they, tough, they toughen up. They get serious about themselves. And so there's a there is, you can see it now in America. There's sort of a red patriotism and a blue patriotism, and they're both sort of conscious of we can't be fools and look bad and stupid to the other guys. And so it's forcing them to kind of clean up their act and get get better at things. And that's like a, that's the rivalry. It's the team rivalry thing. And I think and th things get better because of that. Back and forth. And, yeah. and so that, from an investment point of view, yeah. whether you're investing in AI in San Francisco or in you know oil in Louisiana, you can both do well. If you, if you think it through, and this is, again, back, back to Yunkin and deal makers. if you say, listen, AI needs energy and energy needs to be burned and consumed. So let's work together. Let's, comp let's have some co compromise on carbon capture, something or other, and, you, and make new islands with it or make new high rises or, or something. Do all that, and that becomes the sort of deal making that overcomes the sort of horrible polarization we're seeing, that could, which would could could end up in something we both don't want, which is some kind of civil war. Yeah, yeah, we don't much better make deals. I love this. Uh, when's your book come out? Uh, May twenty eighth. May twenty eighth. Okay, so I'm I'm going to get it. And the other thing is, uh, you got to come back on. You're like a one in, one man. Um, innovation machine in yourself i'd love to thank you and so i get you i have a couple other people that i've you'd be do you know john malden john malden he does, he's a futurist as, as as well you're not quite a, okay. anyway there there's an interest I'm, i can see where we could actually offer up a lot of positive direction for a lot of people that are not getting it much now well i i think it's also the beginning of a pretty good political platform it is and again starting with we need to rethink the divides what i think would be a, a pretty good political pitch 
would you like three thousand dollars <laughs> per person like they, like they do in alaska well, i'm making the same offer that well, they I, make in alaska I, I know both both joe biden and donald trump would like that too <laughs> I, I, look at least you have to get the, the if you want the yeah. country on board you want the you want people not to murder you and they want you to defend them against the chinese you have to make some concessions some some deal making yeah well i'm with you on that and i, I think uh let, let, let's 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 wind this one down right now but okay. let's 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 do it uh, next time be great fairly soon and get into some of these ideas i want to dig into this more and we'll come back with some specific new specific stuff in the meantime everybody's got to got to buy this book on may 28th it's on amazon you can pre-order it uh if you want to think about things very differently, I think this is one of the great places to uh, to start. So, Jim Pinkerton, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thanks for joining. And as you know, you can find us on all the major podcast platforms on Substack now. We're also on CPAC now. Not Substack now. Substack and CPAC now on, on Monday nights and now more often on another two, two or three nights a, a week. So anyway, thanks for joining. Uh, uh, please subscribe if you haven't already subscribed. Tell your friends too. And uh, uh, as always, you can send us some email or messages about uh, things you'd like us to cover and we'll, we'll get at it. So thanks for joining.